Assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, lecture by Brother Isama at HKU. Uh, I, my name is Saad Mehdeen. I'm the chairperson for Muslim Student Association at HKU. And uh, uh, Isa Bhai is a past uh, vice chairperson of MSA. He's an alumni of both HKU as well as um, Muslim Student Association. He is currently uh, uh, almost a full time YouTuber, I think. Unemployed. Unemployed. <laughs> Same thing. Um, but he has 100,000 subscribers, and I've watched his videos, and, and I'm sure most of you have as well. Um, he has a really good way to, to, uh, to, to explain things uh, in, in a way that everyone understands and everyone finds uh, amusing and uh, palatable. And I hope uh, all of you can find this talk enriching and learn more about how to be an attractive Muslim. Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to start by saying this is foundation engineering. Welcome to the course, but since you already introduced me, that joke is gone. Um, but welcome to this talk on how to be an attractive Muslim. A few disclaimers to begin with. Uh, number one, we're not talking about physical attraction. Uh, that's something you have to work on by yourself. And uh, that's something that's quite temporary. No matter how beautiful and handsome you are right now, as time goes by, your physical attraction deteriorates. And that's not something people normally remember uh, the giants of the history by. Um, although it could be uh, one of the aspects that people remember you for. Uh, so what we're talking about spiritual attraction, intellectual attraction, and ethical attraction, a kind of attraction that is rooted in your uh, faith, your knowledge, and your moral character. And that might sound very abstract, but um, I think each one of us uh, knows such people who, uh, when you meet them, you want to stay with them. And when they talk, you enjoy listening to them. And when they do certain things, there's a kind of beauty in the way they conduct themselves that makes you want to imitate and resemble them. And when you need advice and suggestion and counsel in your life and direction, you immediately think of these people. It could be a family member, perhaps a wise uncle, perhaps a grandfather. It could be a peer of the same age, a friend uh, you know, from your class. It could be a teacher, uh, either a religious teacher or a physics teacher. Uh, and it could be even you know, people that are uh, uh, not that close to you, it could be a public figure that you uh, see as very attractive and be very beneficial to yourself. So, I think we all know such people, and uh, this is the kind of people that I'm talking about, and this is the kind of people that, inshallah, today in this sharing, uh, I'm going to instruct myself and all of you uh, to, be, to be. Now, uh, you might ask the question, okay, why do I even want to be like these people, right? I enjoy my solitude. I want to be secluded in my in my bedroom, and I just want to, you know, be my be with myself. Why be an attractive Muslim? So here, there's an important distinction between an attractive person and an attractive Muslim. That's why I didn't title this talk "How to Be an Attractive Person." Um, I titled it as "How to Be an Attractive Muslim." The difference is, an attractive person attracts people to himself or herself. An attractive Muslim, on top of that, attracts people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa That is the difference. And to give you an, an example, I'll draw from my personal experience, okay? I have a good friend, Brother Mustafa. Please ignore the person on the left. Very unattractive. Uh, but Brother Mustafa is an Egyptian, uh, and I met him when I was in uh, Taft University. In the third year of my undergraduate career, I was in Boston for exchange. And he was a PhD student back then, he was studying chemistry. So I met him, and you know, he was an attractive Muslim in the way that I just described, spiritually, intellectually, ethically. And he, uh, through interactions with him, he made me love a lot more and love the messenger soul some more. How exactly? Let me give you a few examples. So, a general description of Brother Mustafa, he's a quiet person, he doesn't talk a lot. Most of the time he's silent. But he always has a smile on his face, a very, you know, a very attractive smile. And when you when you see him, you feel positive about your day. And then, uh, uh, you know, he uh, lives near the masjid. He would uh, uh, ride a bicycle to campus every day for 20 minutes. He rejected 
you know, the student dorm, which is, which is cheaper and closer to campus because he wants to live near the masjid. And um, he's always willing to motivate you to do more uh, in terms of your religious practice. For example, at, the, at this time, 2015, I was barely starting learning Arabic. I just knew, some, I just knew the Arabic alphabets from YouTube, and I knew a few words, like marhaban. I was taking Arabic 101, literally, I was taking Arabic 101. And then I was thinking to myself, and I started to memorize some short surah of the Quran, you know, Qul huwa Allah ba'ahad, Qul a'udhu ba'ahad, the ones that we're familiar with. And I was thinking to myself, and I told him, if in this one semester's time, three months, I can, be, I can memorize Surah Yasin, I will be so happy, right? I'll be out of this world. And he said, oh, Surah Yasin, yeah, three days will be enough, three days. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? You are an Arab, I'm not an Arab, maybe you can do that, that's your language, it's not my language, how can I do it in three days? But he said in a very serious tone, he said, look, Isa, it has nothing to do, uh, ease and difficulty has nothing to do with you. Allah decides ease and difficulty. If he wants to make something easy, it will be easy. If he wants to make something hard, it will be hard. So, so just make that intention and start. Don't be, don't be defeated by the assumed difficulty, by, by the imagined difficulty. Just start. And then I started, and lo and behold, within maybe two to three weeks, I memorized Surah Yasin, which was something I never imagined I could do. But he made it sound so easy, right? He just pushed me to do it. And then I said, great, you know, mashallah, I never thought I could do this. Thank you for the advice. Thank you for the motivation. Now I want to memorize which surah, I mean, let me think. Should I memorize Surah Al-Kahf? Because it's a surah every Friday we're supposed to recite. He said, no, 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 start, start with Surah Al-Baqarah. And I was like, again, what? That is the longest surah in the Quran, the second chapter of the Quran, 286 ayat. And some of those ayat are very complex about inheritance, about, sorry, about qala, about uh, divorce, uh, and about um, uh, certain legal issues. It's very complicated. I said, how can I memorize the longest surah of the Quran <laughs> when I have such little knowledge uh, and I'm not familiar with the Arabic language? And he said, uh, again, you know, your goal, you have to set your goal properly. Your goal is not to memorize bits and parts of the Quran. That's too low for you. Your goal is to memorize the whole Quran. That's it. Set a high aim. Start with a high aim. Reach for the stars. Right? Don't limit yourself. And then he said, start with Surah Al-Baqarah and don't worry about whether you can finish it or not. Just start. Just do it, man. Just do it day by day. And lo and behold, within a year, I memorized the Surah Al-Baqarah, which again, was something that I never thought I could do, but he just pushed me to do it. And then, um, after the semester ended, after the, all the exams are done, I was very relieved, I was very relaxed. One day after the Fajr prayer, I told him, oh, he's, you know, we prayed together, and he said, so what are you going to do now? I said, I'll go back and sleep a little bit more. He said, why? Why do you sleep? Such a wonderful morning. Why do you sleep? And I said, no, I only slept for three hours last night. And he said, no, that's one day enough. Three hours is enough. What else do you want? And I said, are you serious? I feel very tired. What do you think I should do? And he said, okay, it's 6 a.m. now, right? And the Dohar is at 1. So you have like 7 hours. Is that is the math right? Yeah, you have 7 hours. And 7, seven hours is enough for you to memorize 3 pages, right? Go ahead, I'll check after Dohar. <laughs> and I was like, I can't do that. I'm tired. I feel sleepy. He said, come, I'll buy, I'll buy you coffee. And he actually, we went to Dunkin' Donuts and he bought me coffee. It's just the simple interactions like this, and the, the simple feeling when you stay with uh, when I stayed with him, I felt motivated to do more, to be a better Muslim, to practice my religion properly, to aim high, right, to improve myself in all different aspects of my Muslim life, and not only the religious aspect but also the character. And he was a very polite man with great manners. And he was a very respectful man. So when you know a person like this. Uh, I was thinking to myself one day, this is only a man who follows Prophet Muhammad وسلم, after more than 1400 years. And I love him so much. So much so that you know, he likes to wear boots because sometimes he makes wudu on his boots and so he can pray outside, it's convenient. And then just because of that, I bought a pair of boots after I came back to Hong Kong, just to be more like him. And then all of a sudden I could understand why the Sahaba were so eager to imitate and resemble the Prophet It's a very natural reaction. When you love a person that much, you want to be like him. So I was thinking, this is only a follower of the Prophet after 1400 years, then how attractive must the Messenger of Allah be himself? Right? So it, it, through interacting with him, I loved the Messenger of Allah more, I loved Allah more, I loved the religion more. And, uh, that's you know not really by him 
te uh, teaching me or telling me what to do. A lot of it was from uh, non-verbal interactions, just by him being an, a, a good example. And then, uh, after almost four years, we met again. And this is earlier this year, in 2020. I went to Egypt. He didn't change at all. I changed a lot. You know, my beard was longer, if you could see. And uh, my hair was gone, because, you know, I just did a lot, so I, I had no hair. I was bald. Um, but, you know, after four years of time, we didn't even talk much during those four years. Uh, we didn't have contact uh, during those four years. But, I, but one day I just texted him and said, I'm coming to Egypt. Are you available? He said, sure, go ahead. Uh, you know, just come and I'll uh, meet you. And then we met, and it's as if we just met yesterday. It's as if there's no time uh, that we have been apart. So that's the kind of, uh, I will mention, that is the kind of love that believers have towards each other, which is something metaphysical, it's beyond material. It, you cannot describe the hope of the love for the sake of a light. It's something that really, you have to feel it uh, to know it. Uh, enough about bromance, right? Uh, if I talk more about this, you know, it, it will be dangerous. People might, uh, people might suspect my sexual orientation. But um, the common qualities of attractive Muslims. This is just a casual list that I thought of. It's obviously not an exclusive list. It doesn't include all the qualities of, uh, of attractive Muslims. And also, people are of different personalities. And Omar and I have attended a, a discussion circle about spiritual personalities. How, as Muslims, we also pursue our religion differently, uh, depending on our personality. So obviously, uh, these are not uh, all the qualities that attractive Muslims have, and it may not apply to all people. Um, but just a casual list based on my experience, based on my understanding. Number one is faith, right? We're talking about attractive Muslim. Of course, Iman has to be there. Faith has to be there. When you look at all the charismatic heroes in human history, Muslim or non-Muslim, you would find that most of them, be it King Arthur or Salah Abin, you know, in the West or in the East, most of them. Uh, are celebrated as heroes and commemorated because they had strong faith in something. Not necessarily a religion. Some of, some of them had strong faith in their religion. Some of them had strong faith in their nation. Some of them had strong faith in their uh, principles and values. Some of them had strong uh, faith in their political uh, you know, vision, communism, for example. So people, when people have strong faith in something, that is an attractive trait. People are attracted to people who have strong faith in something. And then, um, when it comes to, I mentioned, when it comes to the attraction between uh, believers, there's a special extra layer. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات سيجعلوا لهم الرحمن ودا Those who believe and do righteous deeds, the Ar-Rahman, the most merciful, will place for them, literally make for them a special kind of wood that love. So it is literally divinely intervened. You can't help loving someone who believes and do righteous deeds if you are also a person like that, because Allah has intervened and, and put this kind of love between you. So it's very natural for, you know, I have friends from very different cultures. Uh, I'm a Chinese. I have friends from, you know, the Arab world or from Pakistan or from other countries. We have very different cultures. And we might have a very different values, but then we just have this strong love for each other because of our faith, common faith. And this is something that you really have to experience, and it's, it's non-material, it's uh, really uh, metaphysical. And then, even with non-Muslims, there's a powerful hadith, Abu Hurairah narrated, that uh, Rasulullah said, if Allah loves a person, he will call Jibreel, the archangel, and say, indeed, I love this person. So you should love him. So Jibreel will love, will love him. And then Jibreel will go to Ahlu Sana, all the residents of the sky, you know, millions upon millions of angels, and make this announcement, indeed Allah loves this person, so you should love him. And then all the residents of the skies will love this person. And then think about it, all the angels, they have some kind of responsibility and duty in this world, right? They're controlling rain or thunder or agriculture or irrigation or ocean or, you know, the Hong Kong Street Port, or the, you know, U.S. stock market. I mean, they have some kind of job to do in this world. And then naturally, when they love a person, the people on the earth will also be influenced as well. So, as said, and then he is granted the pleasure of the people on the earth as well. So really, this is number one trait we, we need to have. To summarize these two points, number one, if you love Allah, those who love Allah will love you. 
as simple as that. If you love Allah, those who love Allah will love you. And point number two, if I can summarize it, to put it in simple words, if Allah loves you, people will love you as well. It's just natural because Allah is the Rabbul Nas. He's the, he's the controller, he's the king of people. And he, if he loves a person, obviously people will love you too. So that's the uh, first thing we need to work on. We need to establish our faith. And uh, uh, you know we have to acquire knowledge in order to have a informed faith. You need to know what you're believing in and why you believe in it. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, I think attractive Muslims have strong faith. Number two is confidence. And uh, uh, by the way, by giving this lecture, I'm not claiming that I am an attractive Muslim. Uh, although if you think I am, I wouldn't mind. Thank you. But I'm going to give examples from other people. Confidence, why is this an important aspect of uh, an attractive Muslim? So there is a Canadian uh, psychologist by the name of Jordan Peterson. Some of you might know him. He has written a great book called 12 Rules for Life. And uh, he has basically uh, contemplated on his uh, you know, uh, professional career as a psychologist, as well as his faith as a Christian, to extract 12 important rules for people to be living a good life in this uh, world. And his number one rule, his rule number one in the book is, stand up straight with shoulders back, a composure of confidence. And he you know, explained this in a biological term. He said even in animal kingdom, he gave the example of lobsters, you know lobsters, right? When lobsters meet each other in the sea, they will each make a composure. <laughs> they will meet each, each present themselves in a physical way to intimidate each other. And most of the time that avoids conflict. One will know the other is stronger and he will just walk away. You know, the confidence is something that they send as a message to, to, to confront each other, to in, intimidate each other. And then the one who knows that he's weaker will go away. So confidence, uh, it's like a magnetic field. When you have confidence, not only in the appearance, not only standing up straight with shoulders back, but also in the way you carry yourself, right, in your speech and in your uh, actions. If you have confidence, people will be drawn to you because your confidence compels people to believe that you know what you're doing. This guy is onto something. He knows what he's doing. And then people are compelled to, uh, you know, uh, be attracted to you. Let me give you some examples, right? First on the left, Muhammad Ali is a hallmark of confidence. You can, you can hardly find a man more confident than Muhammad Ali. Right? He was the one who said, I'm the greatest of all time. Last week I killed a rock, injured a stone, hospitalized a brick. I'm so bad I make medicine sick. I'm fast. When I turn off the light, I hit the switches back and back before the room gets dark. That's Muhammad Ali. He's so confident, but his confidence is not a blind confidence. His confidence is backed up by tireless training and preparation. So he knew he got what it takes to be that confident. So his confidence was based on diligence and hard work. When you have put in that amount of work, you deserve to be that confident. And also there's a difference between confidence and arrogance, right? Confidence is to know that you're good at something. You acknowledge that. And you acknowledge it's a favor of Allah upon you, right? You don't feel superior to others because of that ni'mah. But you acknowledge you're good at it, and you make good use of that strength in something that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's confidence. While well, arrogance is to attribute it to oneself. You know, this is because of my knowledge or because of my uh, speciality. Um, so confidence can be uh, coexistent with humility. A person can be humble and confident at the same time. There's no conflict here. Actually, when Muhammad Ali was interviewed, uh, during the Q&A session, there was a young fan from Britain she asked the question, we know that you consider yourself to be the greatest boxer of all time. Do you consider yourself the best Muslim of all time as well? Surprisingly, this guy, whose motto is I'm the greatest of all time, said immediately that only Allah knows who is a good Muslim and who is not. I have no right to say that. I am not the person to judge how good I am as a Muslim. Only God knows. So he has humility, he has confidence at the same time. And his confidence is based on work, hard work and diligence. The person on the left is Malcolm X, uh, again, a very confident man, right? He was a, a civil rights leader at a time when black people collectively were considered to be intellectually uh, um, inferior. He was living at a time when the black people in America were collectively mistreated uh, and uh, oppressed and persecuted uh, and marginalized. 
but he was so confident. He was asking for uh, the rights, and he was he was willing to uh, fight for those rights and not to wait around and uh, wait for you to give me the rights. That's where he's different from Martin Luther King. He was confident enough to take action. So he said, uh, for example, we declare our rights to be a man, to be a human being, to be respected as a human being, to be given the rights of a human being in this society, on this earth, in this day, which we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary. That's his slogan, by any means necessary. That becomes his uh, description. And his confidence also wasn't a blind confidence. His confidence uh, was because he knew he was fighting for something bigger than himself, more important than himself. He was standing for a cause, a righteous cause. Although in terms of the approach, right, the method that he took to uh, arrive at that goal, he had some grappling and, uh, and struggles during his life, you know, in the early part of his life, he had some mistakes, uh, you know, uh, mistaken perceptions, and then in the later half of his life, he corrected himself. But again, uh, throughout his life, he was fighting for something bigger than himself. He was fighting for justice for his people, not only for himself. He was, and he's the one who said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So that kind of sense of justice, that kind of service mentality, that kind of uh, struggle and, and strive for betterment of a community was what gave him that confidence. Right? He was doing it not for himself, and that's why he had that confidence. So, uh, that confidence is based on uh, a goal, you can say, an honorable and a noble goal, and a good intention, right? And then we have, let me give you one more example of a confident man, Sheikh Ahmed Didat. How many of you have heard of Sheikh Ahmed Didat? A few of you. So he was, a, um, he was born in India, grew up in South Africa, and uh, because of his life experience, you know, his multiple encounters with Christian uh, evangelists and missionaries, he quickly became a specialized da'i uh, in debating and conversing, conversing with Christians. Uh, so later he became more specialized in the Christian religion than many Christian scholars. He was very knowledgeable of both the Bible and the Quran, and he had many famous debates with American pastors, priests, Christian scholars. And he, uh, uh, so in this short video, right, uh, a person asked a question. And while he was answering, there was a hacker in the audience. And then I want you to pay attention to the way he responded to this uh, hacker, to this interruption. All right. So I'm going to start from actually um, somewhere in here. Bible. 40 different authors wrote this book. 
40 different people went along to produce this book. This is one man job. Someone said it's one man's Who said that? Which man? Who said that? No, 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 thank you. Please, 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 don't do that. You see, this book, this book supplies the answer to what Jesus said. He said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. How we when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you to all truth. This book guides mankind into all truth, meaning solves all your problems. The Holy Bible doesn't do that. Jesus Christ himself, he says, I've got many things to say, and you are incapable of receiving it. And he didn't give you, and no, uh, uh, the Holy Ghost has told any church in, uh, in this past 2,000 years, solution to the problem of race, Solution to the problems of alcoholism. Solution to the problem of surplus women. There are dozens of problems to which this book does not give an answer. Whereas Jesus Christ prophesied that there is somebody coming after me and it is he who will give you solution to all your problems. Then in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 12, you read there a prophecy. It says, and the book, the book is given to him that is not learned. And we mean, saying, Iqra, read. And he says, Ma ana He said, I am not learning. The book, what book is he talking about? Which prophet said, I am not learning? Now, if you read the history of Muhammad, his life, the first revelation that was given to him in the cave of Iraq, the archangel Gabriel comes to him and commands him in his mother tongue, Iqra, read. And he says, Ma ana I am not learning. It's a word for word fulfillment from the book of Isaiah. Then in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 19, it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he, that prophet mentioned in 1818, speaks in my name, so I will require it of him. Now, he says, that prophet is speaking in my name. In whose name is Muhammad speaking? No. He says, Bismillah rahman rahim in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Bismillah rahman rahim In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Bismillah rahman rahim Every chapter of the Quran begins with the formula in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. And these are all the fulfillments which goes to prove that the Quran is the word of God. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, but you may have noticed that when the heckler interrupts it, he smiled. He gave this very beautiful smile. He said, no, 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 it's okay, please, please, don't do that. Don't, don't be harsh towards him. That's his confidence. Because he knew, I don't have to violently retaliate uh, your interruption because I'm going to logically, intellectually, and reasonably crush you in a moment. Right? And then he gave all of these quotes from the Bible, which he has memorized by heart, and uh, perfectly proves his point. So this is a confidence based on knowledge. When you have knowledge, you don't have to be violent. When you have knowledge, you don't have to be uh, angry and reactive. So, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Didas, a lot of times before his debate, he already won. Before the debate began. Just by the way he presents himself in, in, on the stage, in front of the audience. And a lot of times when his uh, opponents quote a, a, a verse from the Bible, and he will say, wait a minute, you made a mistake. <laughs> because he knows the Bible better than most of his opponents who are Christians. So this is a confidence based on knowledge. Um, and uh, yeah, I've shown three different kinds of confidence, you know, through hard work, diligence, preparation, training, through fighting for a just cause, you know, for justice, for a, a project bigger than yourself. And Gandhi said, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others, which is a powerful statement. Uh, that gave him confidence. And for, in the case of Sheikh Ahmed Idad, it is experience and knowledge uh, and expertise that gave him uh, confidence. So that's uh, the second trait which I find to be common among, uh, yeah, uh, among attractive Muslims. But ultimately, as Muslims, there's a powerful statement from Omar ibn al-Khattab He said, "Inna kunna adallu qawmin fa'azana Allahu bi'islami fa'mahma natalu bil'izzat bi'ghayr ma'azana Allahu bihi 
I've done that a lot. We were a disgraceful people, a lowly people, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored us through Islam. And if we seek honor from any other thing, other than besides Islam, Allah will disgrace us again. So this is a problem uh, that we're facing nowadays. As Muslims, because of the past 200 years of uh, a slightly weak period in you know, the cycle of history, it's like a sine curve, there are better times, there are good times, but the past few centuries for Muslims have been a relatively weak time, and then we have become a little bit culturally inferior. Right? And you're praying in a corridor, and your friends come by, hey, what were you doing just now? Oh no, it's like Middle Eastern yoga, it's pretty good for your body and stuff. You know, we, we lost the confidence to stick to our religion. When people ask you, why do you worship God? That's so backward, man, that's so... You don't believe in science or anything? You know, the response should be, why don't you worship God? You know, God created you and provides for you, and you don't worship Him? What's wrong with you? Where's that confidence? Right, we need to find our honor, raise dignity, again, from Islam, as Omar said. If you try to find confidence in your social status, in your salary, in the job title on your name card, in the organization that you are in, right, in any worldly possession and wealth, in your academic qualifications, it will not give you confidence. Even if it gives you confidence, it's a very short-term, temporary confidence. Real confidence comes from yaqeen, conviction in the truth. That will give you the confidence of Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali and uh, Sheikh Ahmed Didat, inshallah. So we should remember this. We should find honor with Islam. Never feel shy about your religion. Never feel shy about your faith. Um, I'll give you a personal uh, example. All right. Uh, once I was in uh, a, a city in, so, so actually just this year, January, I was going to meet my parents in a city in mainland China. And I was at a bus station, one of those long distance uh, bus station. And it's awesome time, I think. And because it was like Chinese New Year period, it was super crowded, so many people there. And I couldn't find a spot to pray. But it's awesome time and it's about to pass, so what do I do? I went directly to the office, to the bus station office, with all the police officers and prison uh, and the security guards and everything. And I said, hi, I'm a Muslim. It's time for me to pray. I don't have a place to pray. Can I pray in your office? And guess what the officer said? Sure, no problem, go ahead. And when I was praying in his office, I heard him say to another employee, don't enter, don't interrupt, he's praying. So I really, and I've experienced this many times, I find when you are confident about your religion, people respect you. When you, how to say, have that kind of, uh, um, what's the word? And I cannot think of another word except confidence. <laughs> when, you, when you have confidence, people respect you, right? And, and, and uh, this can be manifested in many different ways, in terms of wearing hijab, sticking to your prayer, no matter where you are, as long as the time comes, you pray there. You know, pray in the airport, what's the big deal? The, the entire grant is a masjid for the Muslims. It's created by Allah, worship Allah wherever you can. And uh, in terms of uh, making wudu in a public toilet, I know this is, a, this is an embarrassing one, right? <laughs> and a lot of things that we lack confidence to do, because we think people will disrespect us. But when you actually stick to it, just try, experiment, people will respect you for holding true to your faith, for being steadfast in your religion. For if you don't respect yourself, nobody will respect you. Uh, I think that's the general principle. And I forgot, yeah, when, when I was talking about faith, there was also an example of the attraction of faith, the power of faith, which I really want to share. So during the time of the Prophet وسلم, a dispute happened between two men over the ownership of a palm tree. To settle the disagreement, the Prophet requested one of them to hand over the ownership of the palm tree to the other in return for a palm tree in paradise. The man refused. Abu Dahdah not Abu Darda, Abu Dahda, heard this and he offered, he, he approached the man who refused to hand over the palm tree and said to him, sell me your palm tree for my orchard, for my garden of palm trees. I'll give you my garden, you give me this one tree. Of course, he accepted. And then he rushed to the Prophet and said, O Messenger of Allah, I have purchased the palm tree with my orchard, so hand it over, uh, so hand it over to him, for I have handed it over to you. The Prophet said over and over again, how plentiful are the sweet date clusters that Abu Dahda now has in paradise. And immediately Abu Dahda returned back home to his wife and said, you know, Ya Umma, uh, umma Dahda, mother of Dahda, walk out of the garden. 
for I have sold it in place for a palm tree in paradise. Her response was unconditionally supportive. What a successful transaction. She didn't say, what the hell, what did you do, what? What did you just do? <laughs> you just sold our living for what? For a promise in heaven, literally a pie in the sky? Did you just do that? She didn't say anything like that. She said, what a successful transaction. This is faith. Uh, and this is, you know, this is what attracts believers. And, you know, when you have faith, you read stories like this, it really moves you, touches you. Okay. Uh, so then, uh, she then made her way to her children and took out from their mouths the dates that they were eating. And then emptied their, emptied their pockets and sleeves as well, and then left the garden for its new owner to take possession. Because they believed the promise of a lie, this messenger, to be true. When he says there will be a palm tree in, gar uh, in paradise waiting for you, that's, that's a hack, that's a fact. You just wait until you get there and see it. It's not a pie in the sky. It's literally happened. Uh, because the prophet also never lies. And Allah never lies. So, yeah. Number three is the respectful are respectable. So from a psychological perspective, human interactions are a lot of times reciprocal. What that means is, basically the way you treat others will translate into the way they treat you. It's as simple as that. And this actually happens in the animal kingdom as well. It's a reciprocal inter in, in, interaction. And every single person wants to be valued and respected. It's just human nature. So when you respect and value others, those who are valued and respected by you will be attracted to you. They want to be with you. Because they, they enjoy that feeling of being respected and valued. So they want to be around you all the time when you make them comfortable. So this is the simple idea of the respectful or respectable. And uh, in the Islamic tradition, scholars often emphasize the, the importance of adab. Like Imam Malik said, تعلم الأدب قبل أن تعلم العلم Study, learn manners before you learn knowledge. Almost all the Islamic scholars emphasize this. When it comes to manners, it's about how to welcome people, how to greet people, how to approach people, how to ask questions, how to answer questions, how to disagree in a civil manner, how to converse beautifully. All of these manners, all of these uh, you know, expressions of respect are important, according to them, more important than knowledge. Because some people can be knowledgeable, yet very ill-mannered, and it doesn't make people attract, uh, it doesn't attract people at all, right? Uh, rather, we have some, you know, uh, you, you might have this in your hometown, you might have this in your family, someone who doesn't have a lot of knowledge, but whenever he sees you, he smiles to you, he offers you a meal, he's nice to you, and you are attracted to him. I think uh, there's a scholar, the Egyptians will know this, because he's courted the Ikhwan. What's his name? <laughs> the, uh, Muhammad ibn Abd al-Rahman al-Arifi. You know this guy? Yeah. So, Dr. al-Arifi, he wrote a book called Enjoy Your Life, and he gave an example. Now imagine there's a circle of 50 men sitting together, and you enter it, and you start saying salam to them. Okay, for the sisters, 50 women sitting together. <laughs> and then you enter the room and you start greeting them, assalamu alaikum. First guy is talking on the phone, alaikum salam. Second guy is talking to the guy next to him, alaikum salam. And the third guy is like literally not paying attention to you. He didn't even notice that you, you entered. And then the fourth guy, you know, is, is busy with something that he's doing. And then you just you keep receiving this kind of greeting that is not sincere, not genuine, just by the by. And then you encounter the fifth person. You said, Assalamu alaikum. This person gives you full attention, looks at you, smiles at you, and says, Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? How have you been? How's your family? How's your mom? And sit down, please come on, brother, sit next to me, sister, sit next to me. Come on, have a date. This is from uh, Palestine, very good date. And among these five people, very naturally, you are more attractive to the fifth person. Despite their social status, despite their knowledge and their possession and any other traits that they may differ, you don't care about those. You just know that the fifth person respected you and you're attracted to him. It's as simple as that. So we need to learn good manners. And if you read the, you know, the hadith, uh, you find a lot of teachings about very simple manners. I remember there's a hadith that really shocked me. When three people are sitting together, the Prophet saw some said, Two shouldn't keep talking with each other and ignore the third one. Can you imagine? That's, that's a hadith. So there are a lot of teachings about how you should respect people and make people feel comfortable, make people feel valued and respected. And when you become respectful, you become respectable. Another example, uh, Amr ibn al-As, if I remember correctly, he was once the governor of Egypt. Um, and he was also a pretty you know, uh, prominent Sahaba. And once uh, he was appointed by the, uh, by the Prophet as the commander of the troops of that is Salasil. 
So Amr ibn As because he was given this important position by the Prophet and obviously when the Prophet appointed him, he showed him respect, he showed him trust, right? It's an important position. So he thought that he was the most beloved person to the Prophet He must love me the most, otherwise why would he give me this important position in such a respectful way? So after he returned from the, from the army, he asked the Prophet you know, which person is most beloved to you? Who do you love the most? He said, Aisha, right? <laughs> his wife. And then uh, Amr ibn Ha'as said, okay, sure, yeah, that's your wife, fine, that's fair. Mina Rijal, what about from men? Which men do you love the most? He said, Abuha, her father. And look, he did say Abu Bakr. He said, Abuha, which means his love for Abu Bakr partially is also because of his love for Aisha, that's how much he loved his wife. So, Amr ibn As asked Sunna man, and then who? He said Umar. And he said, then who? And then he kept saying names until in the end he stopped asking. He remained silent because he was afraid that his name might appear last. His name might be he might be the least uh, favorite person by the Prophet. So, so, but Amr ibn As felt that he was the most beloved to the Prophet. That's why he asked this question. Why did he feel that way? Because the Prophet so, so, treated every single one with utmost respect, with great manners, with full attention, in a way that everyone thought that they were most beloved. And this is the most important person on earth, but everyone felt respected by him. So we should never feel, you know what? I was a past ex a, a vice chairperson of MSA. What are you? <laughs> are you on YouTube? I have 95,000 subscribers. Who are you? <laughs> or, you know, my salary is 30K. Who are you? We should never feel superior to people and feel like, since I'm on this position, I don't need to respect you anymore. You should respect me. Uh, no, because the most noble person, the Prophet Muhammad also respected everyone, uh, despite their background. So that's number three, the respectful or respectful. Number four, speak beautifully. This is, I think, another simple idea, but it's often overlooked. So we know in the Hadith uh, uh, literature, the Prophet ﷺ told us, Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, then let him speak good or remain silent. Two options for Muslims. Either what you say is beautiful and good and makes people happy and is righteous and is truthful and is honest, or you just don't say anything. Right? So that really gets, you know, get rid of all the S word and the F word and <laughs> all the complaints and all the uh, bike biting and all the making fun from our language. This is, uh, you know, language is a divine gift. Allah subhanahu wa said, wa allamahu al-bayyan. He taught human beings how to speak. And actually, I took one course on linguistics when I was on exchange. Even, you know, ling linguists who are non-Muslims, non-religious linguists, they say that language cannot be explained by evolution. Language is something that almost jumped into existence in human, uh, in human existence. It, they couldn't explain where language came from. And actually, we don't see the evolution of language, we see the continuous degradation and deterioration of language, which means the early people, the ancient people, used language much better than us. I'll give you an example. Let's not even compare, let's not even compare Shakespeare with the modern English speakers, right? Let's just compare the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, with the recent presidential debate and see the difference. Abraham Lincoln was like four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Fast forward 100 plus years, which is a shout out, man, right? And total lie, absolutely not true, lying, you're a liar, I don't care. So that's the difference. And this, this happens in every language, not only English. I, I believe if you speak Russian, if you speak Turkish, if you speak Arabic, and when you read books written by an author a hundred years ago, you wonder at the way they used the language. SubhanAllah, the way they expressed themselves was so much better back then than we are using the language now. So there is a continuous deterioration and degradation of language. But language is not only a communication tool. And some people might say, well, as long as you understand what I'm saying, it doesn't really matter how I say it, right? So uh, they don't care about grammar anymore. They don't care about vocabulary anymore. For example, when I speak English, I can speak broken English. I can reverse the order. For example, long time no see is not really an English uh, grammatically correct sentence. It's from other languages, but they see it all the time, long time no see. And they, they don't care because it's a communication too. As long as you understand me, that's fine, right? No, not really. 
Language is not only a communication tool. It is the way you perceive the word. We understand the word through language. So from a philosophical perspective, language actually has a lot to do with your word view, with, with how you understand the word. And there's an amazing book called Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. I strongly recommend it. It's not, it's not really about amusement. It's more about this change of culture from typography, meaning words, from the culture of words to the culture of pictures, to graphic culture. And nowadays, you know, whenever you want to learn something, you don't want to read anymore, you want to watch something. Let's watch a YouTube video about it. Even, you know, university professors do this now. You know, if, if, if I want to explain an idea, let's watch a video. Uh, let's watch just graphic impact. Look at the PowerPoint. Look at this picture. Look at this graph. We're so, uh, we're so uh, fascinated by pictures, we gradually lose the ability to process words. But the ability to process words is very important because when you read, you are forced to think logically and rationally. You are examining the premises, the evidence, the logic within those words. And that forces you to be a rational human being. And rational human beings can be civil. Rational human beings can disagree peacefully. And you know, I would even go as far as to argue that many of the conflicts that exist in, in the world right now can be attributed to a lack of language abilities. Just look at the comment section on YouTube videos. People don't talk with each other properly. They're using all kinds of weird expressions that don't mean anything, right? So language is a divine gift, a lost kind of a talatolis to speech. And the Islamic tradition especially started, it's a verbal tradition. It started by verbal communication from Allah to Jibreel to Muhammad sallallahu And that's how our religion was established, on words. And words, 23 years of words, was what revolutionized this nation of Arabs. Uh, it, it made them uh, advanced civilization by words. How amazing is that? And we should really make an effort to learn language, your, your mother tongue for sure, and even your second and third languages. I mean, I'm not a native English speaker, but I think it's important for me to be able to communicate in English effectively and efficiently if I were to use it to communicate with others. I'm not content with just making you understand me. I want you to feel that I'm speaking beautifully and rationally with evidence so that I become an attractive Muslim, right? <laughs> and when I become an attractive Muslim, I don't only attract you to me, I attract you to Allah and His Messenger, and that's more important. Okay, so yeah, I forgot to mention this ayah, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He was describing the believers, and He said, they had been guided to good speech, good speech, and they have been guided to the path of the praiseworthy. Let me see, is there any uh, example here? Mm. Yeah, so uh, again, Dr. Arifi gave an uh, example in his book, Enjoy Your Life. It's an interesting story. He said, okay, so one person is going to the Doha prayer, and Adan has already been called, Iqama is about to be called, he was rushing to the masjid, and then he saw a worker working on a palm tree uh, who is not concerned at all, like he's not going to pray. So he obviously, he, he was, you know, uh, angered by that, and he wanted to call that person to pray. Uh, but the first time he, he said, what are, you, what are you doing, man? It's almost a calm time. Are you deaf? Are you a donkey? And then the, the work is like, I'll show you who's donkey, and he was coming down. So he got scared, he covered his face and ran away. That's a Doha time. Asr time came, he, again, Adan has been called, he come about to be called, he passed by this man again, and this man is on the tree. So this time he said, MashaAllah brother, may Allah reward your work. MashaAllah you're doing a great job, service for the Ummah. How's the, how's the harvest this year? And, it, and the guy said, Alhamdulillah, it's pretty good. And he says, MashaAllah you're working so, so hard, may Allah reward you, may Allah bless your family. And this guy got very happy. And then he said, oh, you must be working so hard that you, you didn't hear the Adan, it's almost an uh, awesome time. So, you know, you can take a break, you know, relax a little bit, let's go pray asa, and then you go back and keep working, may Allah bless you. And this person said, sure, mashallah, thank you so much for reminding me. He came down, went to pray with him. The same person delivered the same message, but in two different ways of expressing it, and the results were drastic, uh, drastically different. Oh, by the way, I forgot. This guy, when he was coming down, he said, brother, you're such a nice, nice guy. Uh, I, you know, I wish I could see the other guy who, who called me a donkey, I want to beat him. And he didn't know he was the same guy. So, uh, in Chinese, we have this uh, idiom, Hua Yu San Shuo, like the same expression can be said in three ways. And you should choose the optimal way, the best, the most beautiful way to convey yourself, and the, the results and the influence can be very different. So, speak beautifully. And number, one, uh, number five, 
eye of the hurricane. What does this mean? So it's an actual nat natural phenomenon. In the hurricane, in the center, in the very center of it, there's this uh, area, they call it the eye of the hurricane, which is entirely calm and stable. And despite the torrents around it, this area is actually totally still and steady. So this is a metaphor uh, for the kind of uh, resilience and calmness that you will have as a believer if you truly uh, have internalized the values taught by Islam. Because Islam is supposed to make people peaceful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Indeed, human beings have been created anxious. Halua literally means always like panicking, <laughs> always in a hurry, always hasty. And when something bad touches him, he panics. He is, you know, jazua, he worries and he's uh, afraid. And when something good touches him, when he has some uh, fortune, he becomes stingy. Right? He doesn't want to give, he withholds, and he doesn't want to share. Illa al-Musallin, Allah says, except for those who pray. So if you are a person who prays, if you have a connection with Salah, you're not supposed to have that extreme oscillation between ecstasy, you know, extreme happiness, and depression, extreme sorrow. As a Muslim who prays, your life should be in equilibrium. You should always be in a state of peace. You know, when people die, even in Western culture, they don't say rest in happiness, rest in joy. <laughs> they don't say that rest in laughter. That would be scary, though. They say rest in peace. Because the ultimate, the, the best state a person can be in is peace. And that's our pursuit. And Allah is as-salam. We want as-salam alaykum. We don't say as-salam alaykum. And may you be happy. No, may you have peace. So, we want to, this is something that really attracts me personally a lot. For example, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, someone, you might know him. Once, he was having a you know, panel talk, and one of the audience gave a very offensive question. And she was literally shouting. She was so loud, very rude. She even used some bad words. And she was, you know, very emotional. She asked this question. And Sheikh Hamza Yusuf listened to her question and said, Thank you for your question. He's <laughs> still very calm, very quiet, very composed. And when he answered the question, he was very humble. He said, you know, I acknowledge the point that you've made, and I understand your concern, which is for the benefit of the ummah. And, you know, he, he, he still sees good in that kind of rude behavior, and he remained calm in that situation. So that's something really attracts me personally. I feel like that's the hallmark, a hallmark of faith. If you are a person of faith, you should be calm. You should not be overreactive. And this is, you know, a, a kind of state that the media culture is pushing us to be. It pushes us to be overreactive. If something happens, what's your response? What are you going to say? What are you going to do? You know, somebody insulted the Prophet Sallallahu Aren't you going to repost this? Boycott French product. If you don't, you're a kafir. You're a munafir. You know, you love the Prophet What are you doing? I'll stop Allah. What kind of Muslim are you? People want you to react very fast, very swiftly to things. But then, what about you know, patience, which is also a character encouraged by Islam. What about uh, alternative approaches? I mean, the Sahaba had different personalities. They dealt with things differently. Some of them are more, you know, withdrawn, and they like to take their time. Let me analyze the situation. Let me see what's going on first. Let me, you know, evaluate the situation and come up with the best solution. Uh, I don't want to react just for the sake of reacting. I don't want to do everything emotionally. I want to be reasonable. I want to use my rational faculties. So, uh, so this is something that I find to be very attractive. You may not, uh, but when a person is very calm, you know, something great happens. He doesn't. He's not overwhelmed by joy. He's like alhamdulillah. You know, that's, that's good. But when something really bad happens, he's not overwhelmed by sorrow and fear and worry. He's like alhamdulillah. It's, it's temporary. So a good happens. It's temporary. A bad happens. It's temporary. It's gonna pass. Inshallah, it's all good. Yeah, the American expression. It's all good. And then the Egyptian expression that Abdullah taught me, not here in the dunya, it's just dunya. <laughs> what the big, what's the big deal, man? Something good happened, it's just dunya. Something bad happened, it's just dunya. <laughs> Move on, man. Khair, inshallah, he also says. It's all good, inshallah. So this is the eye of the hurricane. And uh, an example of that, when the Prophet وسلم, passed away, most of the Sahaba lost it. Despite their great wisdom and their great patience and perseverance, most of them couldn't handle the truth. They couldn't accept the fact that this man could die, right? Ali Ismail, even Umar ibn al-Khattab, as great as he is, 
He couldn't handle it, and he was almost, you can say, uh, in a mad state. He had his sword in his hand, and he said he would kill anyone who says that the prophet is dead. It's a rumor. I don't believe it. So, so it's, a, it's a state of panic. It's a state of the torrents around the eye of the hurricane, the, you know, the, the chaos. And then Abu Bakr who came in, right? He went to the prophet's house, saw him, kissed him, right? Basically said farewell to him. And then he came to the Muslims, and he started addressing the Muslims very calmly. And he analyzed the situation very well. He knew what was striking them, what was making them so uneasy. And he started reciting the Quran. Yeah, this battery is not. I'll try this one. Uh, see, it's all good. No need to, no need to fear. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so Abu Bakr analyzed the situation, and he said, "Umar Muhammad is the Rasul. Qad khalat min qablihi Rasul. Afa imat aw kutilan? Qalabtum aw what?" Yeah, so Muhammad was a messenger, and before him many messengers have passed away. If he dies or is killed, will you just turn on your backs? And those who turn your backs, turn on your backs will not harm Allah at all, and Allah will reward those who are grateful. And he recited this, and he calmly said, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadan fa'inna Muhammad qad mat. Wa man kana ya'budu Allah fa'inna Allah hayyu la yamut. Whoever was worshipping Muhammad, then Muhammad is dead. And whoever was worshipping Allah, then Allah is all living and never dies. SubhanAllah, all of a sudden, Omar said he dropped to his knees as if, he only, as if he had just heard this ayah for the first time. But at the time, he had memorized the Surah Al-Baqarah. He knew this ayah very well. But for the first time, he had a very experiential understanding of this ayah. And that's uh, because of Abu Bakr's calmness. He was in the eye of the hurricane. He was not taken away and carried away by the, this you know, tragic event and by the emotional uh, situation. He was calm. He remained composed, and he's resolved this uh, situation. So it should be like that. And some, you know, uh, t uh, uh, maybe I'll give you a few more examples of uh, what it means to be in the eye of the hurricane. It means you're content, right? It means that whatever you've got, you're happy about it. You don't complain a lot. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf also mentioned something that's quite amazing to me. He said the desert Arabs, when he was uh, studying in Mauritania, West Africa, they came to him. Uh, to ask for some medicine, because they have this perception that white people have medicine. <laughs> so they came to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and started describing to him their, their disease. But they would always start by, Laysa Shakwa, I'm not complaining. They would always start by saying, I'm not complaining, but this is my symptom. I'm, I'm suffering from this. This is their contentment. I have a disease, but I don't complain. I'm not blaming Allah. It's fine. I'm just letting you know. And then, so contentment is one of the, uh, uh, one of the ways to be in the eye of the hurricane. And Disagreeable, I think, is a is a very important trait. I think it's a um, a trait of truly educated people. Um, uh, nowadays, many people become, you know, really um, what's the word for it? Volatile. When people disagree with them, they feel like they are personally attacked, and they feel very emotional, and they want to react to it. And eventually, it evolves into a group identity politics. It becomes basically tribal warfare between the left and the right the liberal and the conservative, the Muslim and the non-Muslim, France and the Ummah, right? It eventually becomes just rivalry after rivalry after rivalry. We, we, we again and again emphasize difference and distinction. You are different from me. We use labels to, to categorize people, but we fail to, uh, to acknowledge the commonality, the sameness, the similarities among ourselves. So if, if you're in the eye of the hurricane, it also, it also means you're disagreeable. When people disagree with you, you can take it nicely. You know, thank you for pointing out. Maybe I haven't thought of this before. Give me some time. I'll see. You could be right. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, when he was teaching his students, said, "Any human being's opinion can be accepted or rejected, except the man in this grave." Here he was pointing at the grave of Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Except this man, anyone is not absolutely correct. Anyone's opinion can be rejected, even if he's a knowledgeable scholar. But of course, you have to have the, that kind of qualification to disagree with scholars. But still, scholars are very disagreeable. When others disagree with them, they take it nicely. They're humble enough to, to accept the, real, the, the possibility that it could be wrong. But whereas a lot of undergraduate students start thinking, I can never be wrong. <laughs> so let's begin the eye of the hurricane. All right, so I mentioned five traits, right? Um, before I summarize by this, let's go through them. I, I, I want you to tell me what's number one. Faith, Faith right? Have Iman. Love Allah and people will love you. What's number two? Confidence. Confidence. 
And this comes from different sources, from hard work, from knowledge, from uh, a just cause, something you're standing for. Number three is? Respect. Respect, yes. The respectful or respectable. So we, when we work on our manners and treat people nicely, uh, it will be reciprocated. And number four is? Speak beautifully. Speak beautifully. Beautiful speech. It really attracts people. Uh, and that, of course, also requires effort. You know, make an effort to learn the language, to learn it well. Not only to be able to speak it, but to, to, to speak it artfully, to speak it beautifully. Uh, and that's number four. Number five? Eye. Eye of the hurricane, or you can say contentment, or peace, or calmness. You can describe it in your own way. But actually, all of this uh, are just derived from the Quran and the Sunnah, right? The Prophet has already described for us very well all of the good akhlaq. In fact, he said, in Nana Rais to Liutima, Liutima, yeah, Hosnan Akhlaq. You know, I was sent only to perfect good character in a hadith, he said. So, a scholar by the name of um, Ibn Abi Zayd al Maliki, rahimahullah, he said, all the beautiful character, all the good manners can be summarized by four hadiths. This is powerful. Are you ready? If you remember these four hadiths, you will be a very moral and, and beautiful and attractive Muslim. Number one, is If you believe in Allah and, and the last day, say good or be silent. That's number one. Number two, min husni islami al From the excellence of a person's Islam is that he leaves what doesn't concern him. He stays away from what doesn't concern him. In simple English language, he minds his own business. Don't investigate in people's secrets. Don't ask about the rumors, right? Don't gossip. Don't be concerned about things that don't concern you. Number two. Number three, la tablaw. Don't be angry. Don't get mad. That's the eye of the hurricane. Never get reactive, too reactive, overreactive. And number four, la yumin rahadukum hatta yuhibba liakhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. None of you truly believe and tell you love for your brother and your sister what you love for yourself. So this is empathy, which is really you know, the core of all good character, the ability to, to think from the other person's perspective. When you can do that, you can treat that person the way you want to be treated, and that is golden, moral golden rule, they call it. Uh, and it has been beautifully summarized in this hadith. So if you know these four hadith, I'm sorry I didn't put the uh, translation, English translation, uh, but you can easily find them on sunnah.com, search it on Google. Uh, so if we can really practice these four hadith, we will be attractive and beautiful Muslims, inshallah. So, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make us internalize this knowledge and change our behavior and improve our character so all of us can be attractive Muslims that attract people not only to us, but to love Allah and His Messenger and to realize that Islam is the truth. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all uh, uh, successful Muslims in this world and the next and accept us as Muslims and reward us with Jannah. Allahumma ameen. جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته